<laughs> All right. Welcome back, friend of Fulton Council. My, today we're going to talk with Brother Daniel Reisman, a.k.a. simply Daniel from Australia. I enjoy the Aussie accent from Queensland, the northernmost part of the East Coast in Australia. And he has some questions about uh, proof texts of replacement theology. Is that right, Brother Daniel? Yeah, yeah, they're the, the main things. So we're gonna we're gonna delve into that. Uh, you know, Galatians three is definitely gonna be in there and things like this. Uh, usually, it takes the angle of attack. That uh, look, there's plenty of Bible verses that say that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham. And um, for some reason, people's minds, the conclusion they draw from that is that therefore, the physical element has no bearing at all in this dispensation or in the future or as far as the covenants of God and their eschatological development. So um, I understand it's a big issue. I grew up in a home, well, having Catholic background, obviously we're replacement theolog theologians, theology. And um, so I've, I've experienced both sides of this. Daniel, is there, um, you want to just jump right into like the passages? What's, uh, what's on your mind? What's the first one yeah, that pops to your mind? The first one, and I think it's probably, I've heard people try and uh, sort of rebut the replacement theology argument on this, and I've heard some okay explanations, but not super clear, and I think it's a fairly hard passage. So in Galatians 3, um, 3.16 and 29 especially, and that whole passage in, in general, but yeah, 3.16, it says, and I'll read it to you, uh, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And if you jump down to 29, uh, oh, here it is, 29. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So I've heard people um, not only say that, you know, the church replaces Israel, and we are, we are Abraham's seed, and therefore Jewish people are not Abraham's true seed. Um, but I've also even heard them sort of say it negates the promise to Abraham in, in Genesis 12 that um, that he promised Abraham the land as well, and they've tried to negate the land grant. Um, yeah. So uh, just technical question here. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yeah. Okay, you, can, you can see the Bible there? No, I can only see you. Okay, let me – so let me – Let's go to Galatians. Let's try it this way. How about now? Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it now. You can see the screen? Yeah, using eSword. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So let's go look at it. Is that font uh, big enough for you? Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. So the main... Uh, I'd say the main verse is picking up at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. He says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So we've got this here. They which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham, right? So meaning those who are not of faith would not be children of Abraham, even if they are physically part of Abraham. I'm just undoing there the highlights from previous Bible studies. Uh, let's take off all these. And then, so let's read it here together. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. So then which are be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So here they have in mind, well, that would be the physical Jew who doesn't believe. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Paul here quotes Leviticus. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, everyone, um, for his written curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive this promise of sp the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And here the idea is, they would say is, well, it's not like to the all the physical descendants of Abraham. The whole point is that it's centered in one particular Jew, 
uh, and that particular Jew and his humanity would be Jesus Christ. The next relevant passage of that chapter for replacement theology uh, is 26, 29. And by the way, I'm aware a lot of them don't like the term um, replacement theology. They appeal to Romans 11, ironically, which Romans 11 is exactly about that kind of heresy. And they say, it's not that we're replacing. It's just there's this Israel is a placeholder term, right? Mm. It, it could be anything. It's it's really one entity ever. It's not like one entity is replacing another. And uh, you had Israel was constituted by the Jews in the Old Testament, but now it's constituted by anybody that believes in Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. So it's the same entity changing form, as it were, but there's no replacement going on. But it's still yeah. replacement theology. We can address that. But just to finish here, 26, 29, for, your, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And this is the other kind of passage. The main quote there they have, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so... Um, no, but we don't deny that we are Abraham's seed and that that's the reality is that we are Abraham's seed by faith, by faith. Yeah, we don't deny amen. that. Um, uh, I believe what I read there, what's happening. Uh, I think Daniel is there's a non, it's a non secator in logic. It's, it does not follow. And the, 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 the thinking is the following. Um, they'll say, well, since they'll say, since Paul talks about the true, seed of abraham being a spiritual seed therefore that negates any kind of special standing of the physical seed of abraham and that's the that's the what doesn't follow okay that's that's a leap in logic just because a real a real jew is one that is uh is one that's in the spirit doesn't mean that the physical aspect is suddenly completely irrelevant. Now, here's what complicates things a little bit, is that in the New Testament, in the church age, it is completely irrelevant uh, for salvation. In fact, we can push it further. I mean, I can take that kind of thing and push it further. I can say, well, it's always ever irrelevant. What matters at any point in time is faith, right? Faith in God. So why was it relevant at all that God should have a special uh, physical nation in the Old Testament to begin with then? Why have that set up in the Old Testament, right? Why couldn't why couldn't the God of the Bible just say, "Hey, whoever believes in me is part of my people. I don't care if you are a physical descendant of Shem or Ham or Japheth, as long as you believe in me, you're part of, of let's call it Israel, but he could have called it X, right? Yeah. So if Israel is simply a placeholder term. Why have that set up in the Old Testament connected to a physical reality? God didn't need to do that. He could have been teaching that lesson back from uh, the Old Testament. So that's one. So that's kind of taking thinking and turning it on its head. The other thing is what I was saying is that uh, uh, the, the non secator does not follow. I'll show you an example of this. And uh, the classic text that people appeal to is uh, Romans chapter 2. And I did a Very video about particularly that – that, uh, that passage, Romans chapter 2, and the very end of Paul's epistle there in Romans chapter 2. I'm just going to open also yeah. my notes meanwhile. So in verse uh, 28, he says, For he's not a Jew which was one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, <clears throat> but he is a Jew which was one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not uh, of men, but of God. Okay. Yeah, so I the remember problem... you did a video on that. Yes. So the problem with that kind of it, thinking. It was very clear. I'm sorry? It was very clear. That's one, to me, it's not that hard to understand that one. And you explained it really well in that video. Um, and yeah. You, so I mean... just to kind of go over it quickly, like for the sake of the audience, if they haven't heard that video, the idea is that um, the context of Paul's phrase is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, is among the Jews. As per Romans chapter 4, verse 12, he's already talking contextually among the Jews. He says, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only. So you're beginning with the physicality, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. So that's his context there. So why did what did Paul state then? That a true Jew is one who is Jewish both inside and out. 
Now, he did not say that any Gentile who is Jewish inside is a true Jew. That's the non-secretor. That's the leap in logic that people do. So, and the illustration I use is essentially, uh, if a farmer, if a farmer... The, the strawberry uh, and the watermelon. Right, the true strawberry is one that is red both inside and out. And then yeah. you would not be justified in finding watermelon concluding, well, the watermelon is not red on the outside, but it's red on the inside. Therefore, it's a true strawberry. That, that's a, it's a logical fallacy, right? He's just emphasizing that what makes a tr true strawberry is the inside, but you still need the outside for it to be uh, a strawberry. So in the New Testament, the reason why Paul goes to the whole we are Abraham's seed is because, and he explains why he goes into that. What he's saying is this. The, the, he's not saying that... Uh, Israel is a placeholder. He's not saying that we are replacing them. The main issue in Paul's mind, he set it out in Romans chapter 9. He says, uh, because you know most Jews were rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Romans 9.1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bring me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Okay. Who are Israelites. So they're according to the flesh, but they're still Israelites, even though they're lost. He's calling them Israelites. To whom lost Israelites pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, at least in the Old Testament, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. But he says, I'm burdened because they haven't all believed. So most Jews hadn't believed and most Jews were going to hell. The question then is, well, then what happened to God's promise to Abraham that everybody's going to be blessed through his seed? And this is the issue here. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for there are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. So Paul's argument is this. He's basically saying even in the church age, God's promise to Abraham about a, a seed has not failed because Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ are have Abraham count as Abraham's seed spiritual though it may be so even though physical israel is not counting for the seed because of the rejection of the gospel there is still a fulfillment of god's promise to abraham and that abraham now is gaining spiritual seed but the problem in logic here is that because there's a spiritual dimension to the seed that that negates the physical dimension or because there's a, such a thing in the church age as the children of abraham who are by faith that that negates this idea that there's going to be children of Abraham in the future who must both be children by faith and by flesh. One does not disannul the other. The Bible says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts on both sides. So the problem, the, the mistake of the people who say that physical Israel has lost its role or has no eschatological role to play is that they, they because Paul highlights one edge of the sword, they take that as meaning as negating the other edge of the sword. And that's a mistake. The one does not negate the other. Yeah. And I mean, in, in Romans 2, 7, it even says to um, 2, 17. It, it, it's, so I think that maybe there's similar passages in a lot of ways, but it says in, I mean, it's very clear in two, Romans 2, he's talking to Jews already there and behold, thou art called a Jew in Romans 2, 17. Um, so he's talking to Jews there um, and it's, it's an Old Testament setup that's being talked about. It's not, so I don't, I don't know, but I don't think uh, Christians have the circumcision of the heart. I mean, we can, but I don't think that's talking about the same circumcision made without hands that's in Colossians. I think it's talking about, I don't know, I'd love to hear what you think, but I'm not so sure it's talking about the circumcision of the heart that a Christian has that's made by God. Um, it's talking about somebody who's keeping the law. Um, so, yeah, okay, so I, okay. So I think I understand what you're saying. So if you if we transpose ourselves to an Old Testament setting, okay, if we transpose ourselves to an Old Testament setting, then you're right. Circumcision of the heart is not describing the kind of operation that God performs upon a salvation of a church age saint, which as far as we understand, it seems like it's the Lord that literally, uh, if I understand it correctly, separates the soul and the spirit from the flesh and that's why when we touch something unclean nowadays it doesn't contaminate the soul because they're not in contact anymore that didn't that operation could not take place in the old testament because the holy spirit was not yet given john is clear about that john chapter 7 so and there could there was no new birth in the old testament so in that sense when the bible talks about 
uh, when God would condemn them in an Old Testament setting for being uncircumcised in the heart, you're right. It's not. It wasn't talking about this this ontological operation that takes place in our spirit and soul upon our salvation. But so on the so on the nat on the nature the 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 nature of the operation is we're we're describing two different setups. Uh, in the Old Testament, their flesh and their soul was still fused. In the New Testament. It, they've been split apart by spiritual circumcision. That's true, but in in practical terms, it it uh, as far as the lived out life, it means the same thing. Basically, he's saying if you're circumcised in the in the Old Testament in heart, meaning you love God, you believe in God, and you obey His commandments, and you have light, you have understanding, you have spiritual wisdom and understanding of the Word of God. And of course, today the only way you can have that kind of light and understanding is if you're spiritually circumcised. So. On, on, on the ontological level, I agree with you. In an so, Old yeah, Testament setup. talking about someone who's following God in the heart, not just right. by an outward appearance. And so, yes, that right. does apply to Christians today. But as far as the setup that it's talking about, I mean, it's got further in the chapter. It talks about, um, or earlier in the chapter, in I think Romans 2, it talks about uh, eternal life to those who with patient continuance in doing well, in well-doing, So, which is a works thing. So it's not talking about a what? salvation defense. He's setting up an argument about you're not keeping the law anyway. Well, okay. He, uh, so one thing I want to be careful about is I don't want to fall into the personally the trap of let me pack up as many arguments as I can on my side. Uh, sometimes we all fall for that, and then that that kind of feeling was like, oh, if I, I have three good arguments, but if I could read this passage in, a, in this way, I'm going to have four good arguments. And that actually leads us sometimes to kind of do funny things with the text that I'd rather not do. I was We were just talking about the Romans 2 at church at Hope Baptist Church in Montreal on Wednesday. There was a question about the salvation, Old Testament salvation. What Paul is setting up in Romans chapter 2 is, is a generic principle in connection with salvation that is true in all dispensations at all times. Uh, when he says, who will render to every man according to his deeds, that is true even in the New Testament in the church age. This is not something specific to the Old Testament. He's describing the principle on which God works. Now, he's not saying that God is justifying you because of what you do. He's just saying who will render every man according to his deeds. So yeah. I'll clarify the thought in a, in a minute. So let's just read it. Let's try and read it like it's just a generic principle. Because Paul seems to be painting with a very broad cross-dispensational brush here. So he says, who will render to every man according to his deeds... To them who by patience, uh, patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Now this here, this is, isn't this true in the, in the church age? Well, I mean, you don't get eternal life by patient continuance in well-doing though. Not oh, sorry. Today. Let me, let me, uh, let me go like this. Uh, guys, two verses eight and nine aren't those true even now? Yeah, they are. Yeah, so yeah. so six and seven should be true even now. The reason why we're scared of saying yes is because we know that we're not saved by works, and it sounds like Paul here is saying that we're saved by works. Sounds like you know, that. but it's kind but of hard. In the Old to... Testament, there was an element of works that they had to do. Right, right. But it's like we are, but because we're scared that six and seven could sound like it's applying to the church age, and that's Paul's fault, quote unquote. We insert this art artificial division by kind of telling ourselves, well, six and seven is describing uh, the Old Testament, but eight and nine are describing now also. Every time, every every exactly. That's why I believe six and seven is also describing now. Okay, now that doesn't mean we're saved by works. I'll I'll, sh I'll show you why. So, but that's how I take it. That it's a generic principle. But, but I think our like Calvinist said, brethren the word cuts both ways. So you can apply it in a certain sense now. Correct. But we don't. Do, Correct. But 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 the the apl application there under the Old Testament was different. Surely. Correct. Exactly. That's why I say it's just a generic principle, even now. Even in the church age, it is a generic principle that God deals with you according to your deeds, even in relation to salvation. I'll, and, and I'll show what I mean because Paul shows what he means. Okay. Uh, but glory and honor and peace to everyone that worketh good. I'm in verse 10 to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no respect of persons. Now, again, this is church age stuff still. 
for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. I mean, that's true in the church age. And as many as have if sinned in the law have, shall be judged by Christ, the law. Yeah. yeah if that's, you don't have Christ. Right. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. So that's still true in the church age. So what Paul is saying is simply in the, so it would be like this, basically. Generic principle. In the Old Testament, God rendered to you, you know, according to your works. So if you feared God, believed God, and you tried to live according to your conscience, and were whatever revelation God had given you, namely that of the conscience or of the law, if you're a Jew, then you died, but you can't earn heaven by your good works. They're never going to be good enough. So you still end up an underground captive uh, in prison until the shedding of the blood of Christ for, for their missions that are passed. So that's how it operates in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the way it operates is if you are seeking the trying to do the truth, seeking the truth, then God will reveal to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and lead you to salvation. And we've got the case of Cornelius, for example. Why is it that it's Cornelius that gets to get the heavenly apparition, right? The angel that appears to Cornelius and tells Cornelius, go call for Simon the Tanner. He's going to tell you what you ought to do, words whereby you might be saved. How come it's Cornelius that gets that revelation? Not Mr. He X. Was seeking. He was be seeking. Right. He wanted right. the light and God gave him more light. Correct. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 23, to him that ordereth the... And let me show it for the benefit of the of uh, our audience here too, but Psalm... And there's multiple generic verses like this. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 23, Lord says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. Think Cornelius. He didn't say, because you're ordering your salvation aright, I'm going to save you. You know, I'm going to justify you based on your works. He didn't say that. He said, if you're, or, and keep in mind, this is the King's English. So conversation means behavior. If you order your life right, God will show you how to be saved, which is what he did for Cornelius. So Romans chapter yeah. two is describing the church age, but it's just laying the, 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 the backdrop prince of generic principle of how God operates. Um, now, of course, that's, God is that's gracious. That's a very good verse to show a Calvinist as well. Correct. Yes, I'm sure they're, our Calvinist uh, friends are fuming right now. You know, they're like, yo, you're saying it's works. No, we're not. We're, nobody's saying that we earn heaven. Uh, we're, we're being misrepresented when they say this. But And of course, God is gracious enough to show his salvation to a whole bunch of people that are not ordering their conversation right. But that's because he's a gracious God. You know? Or sometimes he wants to increase level of condemnation in some cases on so he can tell them in the day of judgment, I told you, I knew you were going to reject, but I told you, and look, you rejected. And I mean, it, uh, definitely in the Western world, everyone's heard the gospel at some point, maybe not as clearly as other people, but there's been opportunity to hear it in some form. And if they want it, God will get them the message in a clearer fashion. Correct. They're really thinking. Correct. So the other passage too is, is Romans uh, chapter 11. It's always fascinating to me that we have, we still have to uh, debate this issue of Israel and the church when there's literally a chapter that Paul wrote about that issue. <laughs> you know, he wrote, a, he, yeah. he wrote a chapter telling Gentiles, don't be wise in your own conceit. Ethnic Israel still has a place. Okay. Um, one thing well, quickly with Romans, I think it's in 11, that they are not all Israel that are Israel. That that one, if you just rip that verse alone, Romans 9, yeah. it would seem to say, oh, well, they're not Israel. I mean, you go down in Romans 11, they're um, uh, beloved concerning the election for the father's sake so i mean god's obviously not rejected them i mean that's what the chapter is correct about. good point but, because, but that yeah. verse would seem to say if you just take it for what it says uh they uh yeah i'm just reading on the am i uh, can you still see they my are not all israel which are of israel so if you just i mean so i mean i understand why the replacement theology people get confused on that um, well, yeah, you've got because, to take the whole thing in context but if you just take that I mean then they'll say well you don't believe what it says sure. not a real God, well I believe Israel. I believe it the way just the just the way it stands he what he's saying is they're not all Israel spiritually which are of Israel physically that's what he's saying just because you're 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 a son of Jacob in the flesh does not mean that you're walking in the steps of your father Abraham you know and it doesn't matter if you are a son of Abraham in the flesh. That doesn't guarantee your salvation just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham. You've got to be a believer in Jesus Christ to be justified. So, so would you say it's a sim similar idea to Romans 2.29 where you've right. got to be a Jew inwardly. He's talking to Jews there. 
Yes. You can't just be a Jew on the outside, but not have it on the heart. You have to have both. That Correct. doesn't make Gentile Jews, but in the Old Testament set up or even, um, well, I think, it, I think it, yeah. So like uh, it's, you have to have the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're not a Jew, but they don't have the inside. And so God's looking at that. Um, so you could take a similar idea here. It's a similar idea. And if you go down, you can't really rip that verse out of context in Romans 9, 6. Because, I mean, it's quite clear that they're still his people. I mean, I think in how God rejected his people, um, well, it yeah. says that. It's not well, talking I mean, about the church there. It's so his people. This here, to tie it in with your Galatians 3 verse, neither because they are the seed of Abraham. But you see how he's, Paul still recognizes that they are the seed of Abraham physically? Yeah. So he literally in the verse is saying, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. So they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? So he recognizes their physical, um, their, their, they, they, they constitute a physical Israel. And the Lord yeah. does the same kind of thing in John chapter 8. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah same, he says, right. So they, they say in 833, we be Abraham's seed. Right? And then the Lord, when he answers in 837, he says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. So he confirms there is a, such a thing as yeah. physical, ethnic Israel, biological Israel, right? And then he says, ye are of your father the devil. So they'll quote John 8, 44, that oh, unbelieving Jews are of their father the devil. Yes, but the Lord, seven verses earlier, said, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. So there's still the, the physical Israel that exists, and there's still a role for, for her. But if she's going to get blessed, that physicality is not enough to ensure her salvation although it is enough to allow her a, a um, to uh, to also align her with God that God deals with them according to the promises of Abraham Isaac and Jacob as far as the physical promises because Abraham had not only spiritual promises he had physical promises you know Abraham That's Isaac right. and Jacob were blessed physically with wealth um uh with with uh, just un unusual skill and you can see that the seed of Abraham today has those physical blessings. But for salvation, you need to be a, a spiritual Jew. So when they connected to the synagogue of Satan, the synagogue of Satan are people who aren't Jews. Yeah, he says, which say they are Jews and are not. This is ethnic. Which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Why is he still calling them a synagogue? So those guys there, it's... It's non-physical Jews who are saying that are physical Jews. And we can, you know, the video is not about that today. We can get into that someday. But there's only every, uh, think about all the cults. They yeah. tend to be non-physical Jews who claim that they are the new Israel. So it's a funny yeah. thing because that's closer to describing th replacement theology than dispensation. I think so too. It's the replacement so theologians and they're adher and the adherents of replacement theology who even though are not Jews pretend to be Jews based on the fact that Paul was mentioning you know it's a funny thing too like if you're saying well I'm a real Jew here's another contradiction right they'll say well we're the real Jews because we believe in Jesus according to Romans chapter 2 but then the same crowd will quote Galatians chapter 3 it says there are there is no Jew in Christ so yeah. how can you say on one hand say in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek and then turn around and say but we're the spiritual Jews and that passage, and I've even heard, you know, dispensationalists and, and Rachmanites, which I consider myself, if you want to use a term, sort of aligned with a lot of that theology. Um, I've heard them say, well, there is no Jew. Well, if you'd have to say that, you'd also have to say there's no male or female, which right. that would almost sound like transgenderism or something like that, the non-binary thing. Um, and obviously they're not saying that. And the passage can't be saying that. So there's still male and female. There's different roles. But as far as God's concerned, there's no special privilege access, no brownie That's what, points right. because of being male. And in the Old Testament, there were you know, males could get closer, priests could get closer in the temple. Um, Gentiles had an outer court. So there was these distinctions in the Old Testament, but now there's no special access. Um, it's all freely open through Christ. But these distinctions still exist. But in God, you know, we're all one. In okay. Christ. Here's Galatians chapter Col Colossians chapter three. He says that again about there's in Christ there's uh, neither Jew nor uh, here. Look at this Colossians three eleven. He says we have put on the new man three ten. Forgive me, which is renewed in, renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Okay. There's neither Greek nor Jew. What else does he say? Um, 
circumcision circumcision the barbarian city bond are free oh the one that i want to show you is this uh it's the one that you quoted galatians galatians chapter three galatians chapter three okay he says let's undo the highlights that in christ there is neither male nor female and you're right the transgenders the transvestites really we should say would would you know there's a there's a their justification in the bible there's neither male nor female the same author the same author who in colossians chapter 3 echoes that again unless colossians were written earlier where he says there's neither greek nor jew colossians 3:11 the same author goes on to say this wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them well hang on paul <laughs> i thought there's no difference I thought there isn't any more male or female. Hmm. So the same author says there's no male or female in Christ. In the same breath, then he says, oh, by the way, females, obey your males. Males love your females. What is it then? Well, when he says there is neither male nor female, he's making he's saying in Christ, spiritually, there's no distinction. But physically, there remains a distinction, not only a distinction, but roles associated with those different genders. Likewise, spiritually in christ there's no difference between jew and gentile but physically there's still there still are gentiles and there's still jews and there are specific promises associated to east to each even their physicality which is why in first corinthians 10 32 paul says giving uh, giving none offense neither to the church neither to the jews nor to the gentiles nor to the church of god and he outlines the three groups and in paul's mind even though he's writing about the church of god outside the church there is still the existence of three different groups. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, give none offense neither to the Jews, to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And so those Jews, and look, he's calling them Jews, not Hebrews, because some people will say, well, it's it's Jews, that's a religion. The synagogue of Satan, is, it's a religion. No, no, he's not talking ethnically, because the New Testament, uh, even Ezra, the, the term Jews picked up ethnically. Watch this. Our... The, the, those two groups here, Jews and Gentiles, are outside the church of God. So they're not saved. You can't be saved and outside the church of God, right? So outside the church of God, there's still a group which is recognized as the Jews, not the Hebrews, the Jews. So they still have an identity in the eyes of God as Jewish, ethnically. And so that's yeah. why I say the people who say who are Jews are not, that's ethnic. It's a lie against the people who are not ethnic Jews who claim that they are ethnic Jews. That wouldn't be the the, the guys in, in modern in modern day Israel. That would be guys like Hebrew Israelites. You know, I don't know if yeah. you ever encountered no, that uh, that group yeah, of people. Yeah, no, I've encountered. It. I mean, look, and as far as you know, um, the synagogue of Satan, those who are Jew, you know say they are Jews and are not. I mean, is you've got the British Israelism, you've got the Hebrew Israelites, you've got. Uh, even Catholic would say that, wouldn't they say they replace Israel? So they would say it spiritually. They would say it spiritually. But you're right, British Israelism and, a lot of, yeah. and Hebrews and, whites uh, actually believe it ethnically. A lot of Protestants would even say that. Calvinists would say that, a lot of them. Yeah, spiritually. Um, yeah. Even Islam say, says that, you know, Moses was a Muslim, but yeah. now we are the people of God. So, and... Yes, Islam, there would be a ethnic dimension to Islam because they do believe that physical Abraham was an actual Muslim, but yeah. they wouldn't say they're and Jews. The, They'd say they were Muslims, and and the yes, Israel correct. back then was they were Muslims too. Correct. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like you said, it's a placeholder in a way. Yeah. But um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, cults. I mean, the JWs would say that you know they're the special ones that are going to be the hundred forty four thousand, and they all want to replace Israel. Um, but I would say I don't know, but you know, you said that the the Jew and the Gentile and the Church of God, those three groups, and the Jew and the Gentile are outside of the Church of God, which I agree with. Um, but and of course, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile in Christ. Um, well, what do you say about this verse, though? I mean, Galatians six sixteen, it says, "And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God." So that to me says that God recognizes there is a remnant according yes. to the election of grace. And um, there is a recognition there are Jewish believers. Sure. Um, who are the Israel of God? There? Correct. They be, maybe that's what it's talking about. They're not all Israel who are of Israel. Then the Israel would be the Israel of God, which would be the believers in Christ that are Israel, but not Gentile Christians. It's talking about Jewish Christians. Jewish, there. yes, absolutely. And the, the reason why we're scared of saying that is like I, we, we seem... We're more theological than Paul sometimes. 
because we're so scared that oh that expression the israel of god in in the people's minds who are afraid of recognizing it for what it is which is a designation of jewish believers they think that this the if making that application somehow creates a distinct ecclesiastical group separate from the body of christ and it do, and it doesn't uh this is the only time the you have to get paul okay this is the only time he uses that expression that's the only time he he references this he, he he's always putting the emphasis on the fact that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. But the context of what he's doing, he's he's writing in uh, what they used to, what the old uh, preachers used to call elentic, which is uh, a defense against heresies, right? He's answering a polemic, which is he's he's got all these Judaizing uh, Judaizers, which are Jews who believed in Jesus Christ, but they want to still abide under the yoke of the law. Not only that. But they're seeing a whole bunch of new Jewish uh, Gentile believers, and they're like, "Oh, oh, it's not enough that you believe in Jesus. Come, you got to keep the Sabbath with me. You know, you got to come to the temple. Stop eating that pork. You know." And they're putting him under the yoke of the law, and they're pulling him away from Paul's ministry into, into under their wings. And you can tell, look, Paul is exacerbated by it. He's really like, he's exhausted by it. Um, just look at it. Look, look at the last verse. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's like, I'm tired of this issue. And uh, he takes a personal attack of them. He says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, how long a letter. For many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross. You got to read it with like how he's feeling with the pathos, you know. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, man. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're an ethnic Jew or not, nor in circumcision. What's important is that you are born again, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, right, peace that... It doesn't matter that mm -hmm. stuff. Peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Meaning the, the, the actual Jews who understand this, the actual Jewish believers who understand this. He's not creating some new ecclesiastical entity. He is using a practical designation to say that the Jews who believe in Christ and don't bring you under the yoke, they get it. They're the ones that get it. It's just what like today say? when I talk as a pastor, I still have to use ethnic designations in yeah. my church. I still have to use it. When I'm addressing the church, we've got, we're in Montreal, we've got a cosmopolitan church. Uh, we've got like, you know, 10, 10 languages represented in our church. And, and sometimes we'll have the Chinese believers over at our house, sometimes the African believers at our house, sometimes the Filipino believers at our house, sometimes the Mediterranean believers over our house. And when I address them, I still have to address them based on their ethnicity. Like, you know, let's say like the, the Asian believers or the Filipino believers. Am I setting them up as somehow a separate ecclesiastical body to the rest of the body of Christ. No, everybody understands that I'm talking in practical terms, Just but that spiritually we're terms. one. Right. And Paul is doing the exact same thing. He's saying those Jews that get it, God bless them. That's all he's saying. Yeah. And there's no, um, yeah, there's no special group. There's no special access. There's no, no brownie points, but, but there is a, a, such a thing as a Jewish believer. I've heard people almost scared to say, oh, there's a Jew. If you, if you're a Jew, you must be not saved. Well, no, there's still Jewish people in Christ. Um, they don't have any special points or brownie points or special access, and they don't necessarily have any different roles. I mean, we Agreed. all can be gifted for, with different things, but just because they're Jewish and in Christ doesn't mean they have a special role with anything, uh, but we all have special roles or special gifts sure. just as individuals. Well, um, but there's no special role just because one's Jewish. Um, in Christ, we're all equal, and, and God will deal with us individually. Um, yeah, and, and I'm glad you're highlighting that. That's important because... One of the reasons that you've got some people who um, fall over on the other side of the ditch of like uh, basically, you know, of replacement theology or of just saying that Israel was a placeholder entity is because they see that some Christians uh, sadly think that Jewish believers, they think there's something kind of mystical about them. Like there's some extra closeness to God yeah. by and going to a messianic church, you know, things yeah, well, like that. The messianic this. movement, there's two parts of the messianic movement. I've been involved in that movement in the past, but um they you know you've got the crazy ones where they don't even want to use the name of jesus um some of them i mean that's pretty extreme and some of them you know they're keeping kosher and they're trying to keep the sabbath and they think they're keeping the law and and some of them are gentiles and 
Look, there's a guy across the road from me actually who does this. He's a gentile and he wears a yarmulke and a skull cap and he's got the little and I just think it's ridiculous to be honest. But and usually they've got a very workspace mentality, even with salvation, sadly. Um I'm sure so there's the still one, some safety. You can correct me if I'm wrong on this because I deal with the Messianic Jewish congregation. We sublease to them where we are, uh, good people. And I've asked the pastor there. I want to be clear on that. I'm like, because they, they do keep the feasts and everything. I said, but do you, be do you believe or does any other Messianic congregation that you know believe that works are part of your justification, that, it's that you have to do those things that you're doing so you can be saved from hell? And he told me emphatically, he says, no, we don't believe that. We don't believe that well, none of them will say part of our sin. And he told me, he said, we don't believe that. He says, and I don't know any other Messianic congregation that believes that. Thing is, though, um, I was just going to say, I'm talking about the extreme ones. There's also a side of the Messianic movement um, that is nothing like that. Uh, they're more like just evangelical Christians that keep some of the Jewish traditions and feasts and try and teach Christ from a Jewish perspective. Because there is a lot in there in the Passover and some amazing insights you can get from it. Um, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And right. uh, look, I, with the first time I met up with a, a Messianic pastor, and he did call himself rabbi, which I don't agree with. You yeah. know, Jesus don't, <laughs> said, don't call. I don't agree with that. But, yeah. um, you know, when we first met, we got together and we had bacon burgers. <laughs> you know, there was no, um, <laughs> that's the first time I met him. We literally had bacon burgers. <laughs> that's and cool. And so he was, and, and I went to his congregation. This was a long time before I was a King James Bible believer. And there was a guy in there that um, was trying to keep the law, a Gentile. And they ended up excommunicating him because he was causing trouble and he was wanting to try and say, hey, you got to keep these things. And he ended up going way, he actually converted to Judaism, which is really sad. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah. And, and just rejecting Christ as, um, and request, rejecting Christianity as some kind of pagan thing that was taken from older pagan religion and um, not good. Um, but most of the Messianics are not like that. I mean, if you speak to, I don't know if you're familiar with the teaching of, uh, um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Yes, I have one of his books. And, you Two know, he's, books. I mean, he's not King James only, but, you know, believes in eternal security. He's somewhat dispensational. Um, he's very clear you don't keep these things as law. But there is a is a section in that movement that does. Yeah, you know, okay. And there's a section of that movement will go into denecting, rejecting the Trinity and things like that. Okay, well, but that, again, yes. that's not yeah. the majority. That's not yeah. the majority of the movement. Okay, yeah. But the but, ones that do go to that law, they'll, they'll tell you it's not by works. Salvation is not by works. But then they'll say, like I spoke to my neighbor, and he said, well, faith is faithfulness. It's like being faithful to a, a uh, yeah, nation. Yeah. And yeah. it's, okay, they won't say outright. Nobody says outright salvation is by works. But they'll smuggle it in there, but not right. what works. Right. You know right. what I mean? Right. right. I'll say it's faith. And true faith will do these things. It's not works. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, is, yeah. But it's smuggled They just don't call it works. Yeah. You know, no one no one really says salvation is by works because it's so clear, but then they try and redefine what real faith is. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, I mean, look, some of them are just confused. I know some of them are saved. And, look, like sure. I said, in the, in the Messianic movement that I've experienced, most of them are not like that. They're the extreme ones. Unfortunately, they give the others a bad name. Um, but but uh, in regards to the, the Galatians thing about the Israel, um, Israel of God, would you say that lines up with Romans... Um, 11 about, uh, was it 11 or 10, um, about they are not all Israel who are Israel, uh, who are, uh, didn't quote that exactly, but um, would you say that's what it's talking about? The Israel there that it's talking about the ones that are not Israel and non-believers and the ones that are Israel in the Romans passage. Yes. It's a similar to, it's just the Jewish believers there. So. That it's contrasting. What is, is come again? Uh, where it says, uh, wh which passage is it that says that uh, they are not of Israel whom are of Israel? Sharing the screen. Who are of Israel. So, so that would be Romans 9. Israel. That's Romans, Romans uh, 9. Uh, we'll go over here. Um, verse 6. Yeah. So would you say that exactly, the bit you highlighted there, would you say that's a similar idea to talking about the Israel of God? The, the ones that are not Israel there are talking about who are Israel according to the flesh, right. but as far as salvation Correct. is concerned, yes. God doesn't consider them as his, his they're not saved. Yes. Um, they're still his people in the covenant that he has with his physical nation, and he still Correct. has that covenant, and they're Correct. put aside temporarily. Correct. Um, but the Israel that's accepted is those that are Jewish, that are believing in him. Yes. And, of course, any Christian, any Gentile is his people too. 
and they're accepted in Christ. We're Correct. all equally accepted. But, but the, it's a similar idea, I think, from what I'm understanding, is the Israel of God there. It's just acknowledging there's a yes. remnant. Yes. And, and with, here, with... the Israel there, which are of Israel, is that remnant. Yes. With the caveat that when he says the Israel of God, he's basically saying uh, practically that that group of people represent what was I, what was supposed to happen to Israel. Exactly. The Jews yeah. believe, and and you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have that materialize in the kingdom when. And let's be clear, also, so people don't misunderstand us. The ethnic Israel that inherits the kingdom is is an ethnic Israel that believes in Jesus Christ. So if they die without yeah. Jesus Christ, they go to hell. But yes, it's the same idea. I, I would agree with and that. And that's the one third that make it through the tribulation that will enter into the kingdom. Uh, yes. So From even the one third right, gets cut, cut down uh, further. Cut but yes, basically, yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And that's and the all is shall be saved that Paul talks about in Romans 11. Yes. And so regarding Galatians 3, going back to that about um, year Christ said, which would include anyone that's in Christ, Jew or Gentile, um, you want, okay, Galatians 3. If there's only one seed, that's Christ. How would you tell somebody that's a replacement theology that's saying, hey, the land grant in Genesis 12, for example, and he, he confirms the land grant several times in Genesis, um, but in Genesis 12, it talks about, you know, um, it will give him the land. Yeah, so... It, and again, so, but there's... that's only to Abraham, they'll say. It's only to Abraham, which gets confirmed through Christ. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it got passed on to Isaac and Jacob and then the 12 children of Israel, even though, like you said, much of Israel in the Old Testament wasn't believing. Right. Yet still he took them as his people. Correct. Anyway. And brought them into the um, land. But then now, now in Christ, it only passes through Christ. So if you're not in Christ, that's well, the okay. So, so I agree, but him. we would agree with that. We would, I would amend that every day, every day of the week. That's what we just said. Um, tri you know, in tribulation Israel after our rapture, it's only those Jews, well, Hebrews chapter 4 talks about this, it's only those Jews who believe in Jesus Christ that end up inheriting the land. So what you end up with is you, you're going to have, you're going to end up with distinct, this is what people aren't aware of as much, and I wasn't aware of. There are separate ecclesiastical bodies uh, in the um, as of the kingdom and on in the ages to come in eternity. Not everybody who's saved forms part of the same spiritual body. I think in people's minds, it's just like the era of like Catholicism coming out of Catholicism where people think there's only one baptism. People think there's only one judgment, one general judgment. There's only one general resurrection. And that bleeds over and they think, well, there's only one group of people that's saved. Uh, across the ages. And, th and that's the fault of Augustine who developed that kind of idea. You know, the kind of the city of God outside the city. So uh, they're coming in with a low resolution understanding of those things where all they have is like they've got two pixels that differ. One is the lost and one's the saved. Everybody who's saved, well, it's always through Jesus. That's true. It's always tied to Jesus. But then therefore that the people who believe in Jesus at all ages, at all times, that constitutes one group, the saved. And then the people rejecting Jesus, that con constitutes one monolithic group the lost. So, and that's just not true. In the church age, between early acts and our rapture, everybody who believes in Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, that they form one ecclesiastical body known as, known as the body of Christ. But then you've got the saved of the Old Testament. They're not part of the body of Christ, but they are saved by the blood of Christ. And you're going to have believers in the tribulation, Jews and Gentiles, who will be saved by the blood of Christ, but they will not be part of the body of Christ. They're going to be part of distinct ecclesiastical groups. And so, when we, so there's going to be an Israel that's saved through Jesus Christ that inherits the land through Jesus Christ, and it's going to be a spiritual Israel and a physical one simultaneously, but it's not going to be the body of Christ. So you have different groups saved by the blood of Christ, but still as different groups. Yeah, and, and because they fail to distinguish that, what yeah. we what yeah. we are saying to them sounds like. It sounds mad because it, it short circuits them their brains. And I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a derogatory kind of way. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to describe it. Like I can understand their visceral reaction. Like, wait a second, I, I don't get it. Like, but if you believe in Jesus, you know, you believe in Jesus. There's no Jew or Gentile. Then you turn around and you tell right. me, but Israel has to believe in Jesus. But then if they believe in Jesus, there's no more Israel. No, yes, there is. In the church, there's no more Israel. 
spiritually. They're part of one body. But in the tribulation, they'll believe in Jesus and be part of a different body. So what would you say then? Because the the remnant that comes to faith in the tribulation, um, which is going to be a significant number, um, they inherit the land, they go into the kingdom and will be head of the nations and Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. and the nations will have to go up to Jerusalem and they're going to, you know, every man's going to want to grab the skirt of him that's a Jew and say, hey, God's with you. It's, that's, right. um, that's definitely a Jewish nation happening there. Sure. But in the meantime, right now, how do you then say to a replacement the theology person that, um, well, you know, that's then, but now they're not believing. So therefore them being in the land right now is illegitimate. How would you answer that? Because they're being in the land right now is a, that's a physical, um, it's a physical presence. And they were, God, okay, the people that God brought into the land in the book of Exodus was not exactly a believing bunch. Okay. Yes. A lot, I mean, a lot of them, a lot of them uh, were believers at the day of Joshua, but Joshua himself has to address the people and say, put away the idols, you know, that you brought in from the other side of flood and from Egypt and serve ye the Lord. You can't serve the Lord. Your witnesses against yourself that you said you're going to serve the Lord. And then the Jews overlived uh, and the, of the days of Joshua and that overlived the elders of Joshua. They serve the Lord and then Israel goes astray. And yet, so basically what I'm saying is even at the time of the Exodus, their entrance into the land, Israel is a sinful, rebellious, stiff-necked people to whom uh, Joshua was instructed to repeat the song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30, new children in whom is no faith, it says. So even in their abject uh, uh, lot situation, um, Balaam goes up and tries to curse them and that's turned into a blessing. Well, take the snapshot of Israel's spiritual condition at that time. What were they like? Right after, they start committing fornication with the Midianite girls. And while the priests and the elders are weeping before the tabernacle, tabernacle of congregation, one, guy, one of the princes of the house of Simeon is bringing Cosby and he's, and he's you know doing the deed with her in the tent. And Phineas has to shish kebab them. I mean, that's in the same time frame that God refuses to curse Israel and to bless Israel and gives them the land to inherit. They, you know, So Old Testament Israel wasn't exactly a believing Israel, and yet the Lord put them in the land. I'm just uh, playing the part of a replacement theology. You could say, well, no, yeah, I understand. that generation, yeah, I understand. I get that it. generation yeah. didn't enter the land. Yeah, It was the believing believing. But that's uh, why I'm saying that's, that, that's why. I, but, that's, but, but I already anticipated that. That's why I was describing Joshua's generation. Joshua's, Joshua's gener here. Look at how Joshua describes his generation that uh, that entered in. Uh, um, Joshua. By the way, they entered in uncircumcised, physically. Uh, hmm. Yeah, really. Okay, look, this is Joshua's last address, which it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And look at this. That generation didn't enter the land. Oh, no, they did. That's Joshua's yeah, generation. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's Joshua about to die. That's when he was about to die. He gathered Israel unto him. This is in verse uh, uh, 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called uh, for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and present, they present themselves before God. And then he, he he takes him to task. He says, put away the gods which your father served. And like, he's telling him, put away the gods. They're there. Right? I'll show you something else. Um, I mean, Israel struggled with idolatry almost. Yes, yes. You know, almost all the way through the Old Testament, almost. Well, the, the, the generation of Joshua that went in had idols. Okay. Huh. This is Deuteronomy 31. And they were you said. I'm sorry? And you said they were uncircumcised. Uncircumcised. Right? So they get circumcised in Gilgal as soon as they cross Jordan, but technically they cross in uncircumcised physically. This is this is Deuteronomy 31, right before Moses' death, Joshua was being commissioned to lead Israel. Okay. Uh, so the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation. You know, put your honor on him so they can obey him and things like that. And uh, look what he says here. Uh, 
And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about when? Even, even now. now. Even now, before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. And that's the generation that went in. And God says, I know their imagination. Even now, they want to go in and commit sin or abomination. So that's and, actually in Deuteronomy 31, God's bringing them in the land in, at that time. Yes. And when you read the book of Judges, they go wrong like from the very beginning. He tells you um, they did not drive out like the children were here. Uh, so I the mean, children of, of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites, right? Neither did Manasseh yeah. drive out the inhabitants of Bashan and her towns. That's Joshua's day. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwell in Gezer. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Ketron. Just like now, they, they will not. Now they are forced to in Gaza. They won't drive them out. The, and then what ju Judges chapter 2, an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up, to go up out of Egypt and I have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? That's Joshua's generation and the elders that overlived Joshua. And the, the, and the Lord gave them the land. Yeah, you know, so clearly it's and, a physical and, and promise. It's, and it's not like the Lord, it's not like they're in the land in peace right now. They're suffering. And by the way, why is he oh. bringing them? I'll make this point and, and I'll yeah. hand it over to you, Daniel. But yeah. uh, Ezekiel 36, God brings them back in unbelief, not in belief. He makes that clear. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. He says, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So just like Joshua with idols in the land, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. There is national Israel being born again, according to Romans chapter 11, so shall is, all Israel shall be saved. When does that happen? Then, after what? After returning to the land. So Ezekiel 36 prophesies an unbelieving return of Jews to the land. And once they're in the land, God is now gathering them back to the land of Israel so he can judge them, so he can bring them to repentance, so he can them give them the full extent of the land and bless them. And what? so what right. I would say is, yes, he's preparing them for that judgment. And look, they have not been given the full extent of the land because had they been right with God, they would have from Euphrates to the Nile. Big piece of land, yeah. They, yeah, absolutely. And um, just another verse that sort of jives with that verse in Jeremiah 32, 37, it says, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries. Now, I'm wondering if this is, more talking about the gathering that's going to happen at the end of the tribulation, because I think they're going to be scattered again. I'm not too sure, but um, but I wonder if it also is a partial regathering that we're seeing now. Um, yeah, I'm thinking maybe it's more to do with now, because it says, I think most of the time when you see the gathering mentioned in the Old Testament, it is talking about them going to the land in the millennium and that they're being gathered right at the end there. And of course, there's going to be still people in the land when Jesus returns. Um, and there's also going to be the remnant that he keeps safe in the wilderness. Um, and there's going to be Jews in Jerusalem, because it talks about that in uh, Zechariah 12. But yeah. uh, I'm wondering if this is one of the few passages, I, I mean, Ezekiel 37 and 38, I think it was, 37, wasn't it, um, that you just read there before? Uh, 36. 36, with the dry bones, you know. Um, so there's that. But then there's also um, this one, which I wonder if it's one of the few verses that could be actually applied to the gathering of, you know, the Jews making Aliyah and coming into the land in the last, you know, 100 years. Um, Behold, I will get, the, this is Jeremiah 32, 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. So I'm wondering if that could be divided into two parts. They're not dwelling safely now. Um, so that's probably millennial, but uh, is the gathering in wrath um, you can't say that's in belief, is it? No, you're right. Correct. And again, that's one of those passages that would be a, a two-edged sword where there's a, a kind of a, a near and a far fulfillment. The near fulfillment being after the 70 years captivity, God did bring them back and cause them to dwell. You're right, though. They didn't dwell safely. Uh, they had some measure at safety at different times when they were doing right. They had the Hasmonean kingdom for about 130 years. For example, they were independent. Yeah. And they so shall that's be my... obviously a replacement yeah. theology person would say that that's post Babylon, right? Yes. So, the, so there is 
the near fulfillment in post Babylon. But as you pointed out, uh, did they ever really dwell in dwell dwell in safe uh, safe uh, safely in the land post Babylon? They had periods of it, you know, uh, where they were like independent, where they had to, you know, the Maccabee, the Maccabees, the Hasmonean who founded the Hasmonean kingdom, they had to fight against. Uh, they had to the, fight all the time. All the time, right? And then they lost it again. Pompey came in 62 BC, took over Jerusalem. They had it was periods a, of security, it was a but it wasn't very longly lived. It was definitely. Yes, and they definitely did not have one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. <laughs> oh yeah, true. So that's definitely in the millennium, and so, that lines up with the uh, new covenant. Again, they're being brought back. Correct, they're being brought back. It's after they're bring they're they're brought back. They shall be my people. I give them one heart. So you are right. It's parallel to Ezekiel thirty six that they come so the, back in so unbelief. The, yeah. Yes. So there's Jeremiah thirty two thirty six. That has a and thirty seven that has a double fulfill or triple mm -hmm. fulfillment. You could say like bab, post Babylon, but then the second half of the verse is about dwelling safely and one heart. That's millennium. Yes, because that hasn't happened at all. No, they don't have one heart. And for now, then, for sure. would you also say that the being gathered in wrath? Could you apply that to you know around nineteen forty eight post and pre and post nineteen forty eight? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, what was more wrathful than Hitler? against them that, that drove them to their land i mean because the prophecy has a, a multiple as absolutely of multiple. it is layered prophecy is pattern yes absolutely um, and then probably the one you said in uh, about the bones uh that's a very that's a very strong passage being in unbelief in the land yeah the bones is chapter 37 we read chapter 36 but yes it basically speaks to the same thing uh, more 36 or less. is about what was 36 again? Uh, he says, I will bring you, I will bring you back to the land. Um, uh, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you? I'll bring you back into your land, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you? And it's then that they get a new heart and a new spirit. So they return before is... they got a new heart and a new spirit. And 37 is more about the um. Uh, it's the dry bones it's the vision the... as a as a living army and nation yes yeah, so well the dry i mean the dry bones the 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 graves of the children of israel are actually in the land too so uh, ezekiel 37 uh can be read multiple different ways and there's a resurrection there as well isn't yes there? yes but ezekiel 36 is clear but this conversation will not be complete i want to hit romans 11 because i mean can i just that... quickly go back quickly to galatians 3 um, uh, and sort of matching it with Genesis. In Genesis, um, you know, there's a covenant that God makes with Abraham when he's asleep. It's 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 a non-conditional covenant. What was promised there? Was it the land? What's well, the unconditional part there? That's one question. Other question, or more of a statement, um, you know, God says that he'll make his descendants uh, and his seed um, like a sand on the seashore, but also as a star. So you could say that's a spiritual and a earthly um sort of seed there um and then in galatians when it talks about it says that the promises were made in abraham it says plural promises but i think it also talks about the promise somewhere there as well is it yes so what promise is it talking about in galatians 3? okay is that's that's uh, all the promises you're really just... fanning fanning out there that's a lot of uh a ground to cover yeah, it's a bit there. so it's a bit of ground there. yeah so in genesis 12 the land is not mentioned as part of uh actually not even a covenant is mentioned there, but he does say, go into land that I will show thee in verse one, right? And he says, I'm going to bless you and make your name great. Thou shalt be a blessing, a blessing that bless you, curse and that curse you. And then Genesis chapter 13, um, I think he makes here. After, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that thought was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So there's actually three kinds of seed. Uh, we could categorize them that way. He mentions, if you take all the passages together, he mentions the stars of heaven. He mentions the dust of the earth, but he also mentions the sand of the sea. And a uh, one of the, uh, the co one correspondence you could make is that the stars of heaven are the spiritual seed uh, in the church age, because yeah. you, the, we end up, we are a heavenly people as part of the body of Christ. <laughs> the dust of the yeah. earth, would be would be um anybody that's born physically of abram abraham that yeah. that that is not 
circumcised in heart that's not quote unquote saved. So that'd be national Israel. <laughs> national, not just national Israel. You could also apply it to Ishmael in some sense, you know, the physical seed, right? Sure. Uh, but the sand of the sea, uh, the sea is the Gentile nations. The sand is actually what stops the sea. So it's separate from the sea. So it'd be separate from the Gentile nations. So then that would be a reference to um, Israel, believing Israel as an earthly people in the millennium. So you'd oh, have... So you think the sand of the seashore is the earthly Israel that enters the millennial Correct. Kingdom. Correct. Earthly people, uh, spiritual Jews in the church age, stars, and then the dust is children of Abraham, dust physical. Is Israel and Ishmael. Yes, who are lost or not part of the covenant. Still a seed. And so, therefore, is the Galatians promises. Uh, it says the. Um, now, to Abraham and he said, with the promises made, that's a plural promises. Um, but it talks about the heir according to the promise, singular, doesn't it? So is it talking about different promises there when it's being Abraham's seed? Is a specific promise? Well, you I think mean, that would be salvation. the whole thing can be summed up as one big promise uh, of God because it's part of one covenant. But, the, but then under that covenant, there's diverse stipulations like I'll bless them that bless you. Uh, there's the promise of the spirit, of course. Uh, I'll give you a land. Uh, they'll be head of nations. So at different times that the Lord was appearing to Abraham, he would kind of, there was a, a, a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Every time he would speak to him, there was further an enlargement of what's involved in that covenant. It's one covenant, but it gets enlarged. You know, from one, from just, I'll give you a seed, I'll bless all the nations, to I'll also give you a land, right? That's, that's an enlargement upon that. Uh, to uh, your your seed is going to possess the gate of his enemies, he tells him in Genesis chapter 22. That's a further enlargement. So there's multiple different promises, but they're all part of one Abrahamic covenant, one Abrahamic promise. Yeah. And the Gen Gen Galatians 3 is mainly talking about the promise of the spirit and the promise of you know being blessed in Abraham, which would be salvation through Christ. Yes. Um, but the land isn't discussed really there. Um, you know, if you're going to read that into it, you kind of... I don't know. You'd have to contradict a lot of other verses, but not only that, is it even really in mind in that passage? Well, we do, really. we know we do, we do get the land as part of it because in Romans chapter 4 Paul tells us we get the land. And in and Romans I mean where? in Romans chapter 4. And oh, obviously, really? you know, you and I are not gen are, we're not Jewish in the flesh, so I'm Romans actually Jewish, not that I oh. yeah. Oh, Reisman, yeah. okay. Did you yeah. hear about uh he says this uh he said uh what was it? Uh, oh yeah, this guy. He, he, there were a couple of guys, anti, you know, anti-Semitic guys, are talking. I said, uh, you know what? I, I I've been reading, and it's not a Titanic that uh, sank. Uh, it's not really an iceberg. Uh, <laughs> it, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what it was. So the guy is saying it wasn't an iceberg that sank the Titanic. It was the evil Zionists at the time. It was a banking conspiracy, and they wanted to get the money, collect the insurance money on the sinking of the Titanic so they can create the genocidal state of Israel. And uh, But they told everybody that uh, that's an iceberg. Uh, but it wasn't uh, but it, but it wasn't, it wasn't an accident. It was planned. It was made to sink. And so his friend tells him, no, man, it wasn't, it wasn't the Jews. It was an iceberg that made uh, the, Titanic, the Titanic uh, sink. And the, his anti-Semitic friend says, iceberg, Rosenberg, Weisberg, who cares? It's all the same. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, the conspiracy theories that, uh, you know, pinned on the Jews. And um, you did a video that was really relevant to that discussion, the, the Z, the Z, dirty word, Z. Yeah, the Z word, yeah, yeah. The dirty word yeah, among Christians. Z word, yeah, that was a great video. It really covered some of those conspiracies that are to be expected that would surround the Jewish people um, and not really lovers of God that, are saying that really or so i mean no doubt there are christians that say some of these things but they're not really aligning themselves with what should be a christian um and people who love god um unfortunately some of them are just confused but um and i just looked yeah. it up in genesis 15 like you said there's lots of promises that are the promise about the um the land is confirmed multiple times in genesis 15 it's the one about the learning burning lamp that passed between the pieces of a uh, mm -hmm of the bullet that, you know, when Abraham offered and he was asleep, one of the promises that is confirmed there is um, unto thy seed have I given this land. 
Um, so you would think that's an unconditional covenant too. So yeah, well, that and, part and of the that's covenant at least is unconditional. Um, sometimes we then, get lost in the details. If you zoom out, that's kind of Paul's point. If you actually succeed in proving that Israel doesn't have any more special place, ethnic Israel in God's plan, you've actually succeeded in undoing the doctrine of eternal security. Because Paul's argument is the following. He's trying, what is he trying to do? Like, let's remember what Galatians is about, if we zoom out a bit. Uh, Jews who got saved are trying to get Gentiles to follow the law and connecting their salvation. They, they're telling you have to persevere by follow the law, following the law of Moses. And Paul's point is, no, you got saved by grace. And Addy, any added work after that does not affect what grace gave you, salvation. So whether you do right or don't do right, that has no bearing on the fact that you're saved by grace, whether you keep the law or not. And to prove his to prove his point, he goes back and he says, look, the covenant with Abraham, which was before the law of Moses, right, 430 years before, actually it was more than that, but he's summarizing it for the audience. He says, you have an unconditional covenant with Abraham, with Abraham, and then the law of Moses that comes after, it cannot undo that unconditional covenant. Likewise, you got saved by grace, and the works that you do after cannot undo your salvation by grace. That's the yep. arc of Paul's argument. Where's that mainly mentioned? What chapter? Three. Chapter three. three. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to. Record. I'm gonna have to let you go there, Daniel, in a second. No worries. Can I bring up one more verse? Uh, yes. Another verse that's mentioned with replacement theology, um, I'll just go to it. Uh, Philippians 2, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So the argument would be, well, we're the ones, Christians, who worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Unbelieving Israel doesn't rejoice in Christ Jesus. So we are the we are the circumcision. Yeah. So we are, and no doubt we have that circumcision made with our hands, which is the one that really ma matters. Um, but then they'll say, well, if we're the circumcision, then they're really not the circumcision. Well, see, well, the, the, beware of the concision I mean, there. So. Right. So, right. <laughs> exactly. So, again, we all, I mean, I agree with with if, if they're saying they're not the they're not spiritual uh, Israel. Yes, we agree with that. That's not the point of contention here. You know, the point of contention is we're not the spiritual Israel either. <laughs> of course, a lost Jew is a lost Jew. He's not. He's not. He's not. A, he's not a spiritual uh, child of Abraham. He doesn't count for the spiritual blessings of the covenant. Um. He may enjoy the, the material aspects of the Abrahamic covenant temporarily on earth, but then he busts a hole in hell. I mean, what is it there that that a dispensationalist would disagree with? Nothing. We're just we're just not making the fallacy of non secatur of it does not follow that just because Paul says that lost Jew is not a uh, doesn't count as spiritual seed of Abraham, that does not mean that there are no physical promises associated to that lost Jew. In during his earthly life, they're two separate concepts, and they don't. It doesn't actually say that we are Jews. There, um, you know, Gentile Christians being Jews, it doesn't say that. Um, but we are the circumcision, which is made. We're the ones hands. who are circumcised. Yeah, yeah. That, and it's yeah, talking I mean, about a different circumcision then. Yes, the spiritual, which is which we talks about in Colossians chapter. Too. It's an actual operation, as you mentioned. Um, and not really the same circumcision mentioned in Romans 2, 28, 29, is it? Or you think it is in a sense? Well, it is in a sense, because we worship. Sorry, God just to spirit. get my thoughts in order here. He says, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So when you get saved... Christ separates your soul and spirit from your flesh. And so that's why Paul says, we are the circum we are the circumcision. In what sense? Spiritual circumcision. But he, you're, but he didn't say, but they were. You're, so sometimes circumcision is used uh, you've, um, as a paraphrasis, a paraphrase for Jew. Absolutely. Just like he does here, beware of the concision, right? 
It's That's talking not, about Jews there. It's it's talking about Jews there. Yes. So, but then, but. That's not the case every single time. He says, for we are the circumcision, and he defined it in Colossians chapter 2, that we are we are the ones who are circumcised. Meaning, if, you, if you've got a physical Jew going around boasting that, well, I'm circumcised. Well, you know what? I am I am circumcised. No, but when I say I'm circumcised, I am not answering him. I'm answering him according to the same modality of speech, which is using circumcision. But I'm not answering him to mean that uh, I've replaced him as a Jew, you know. I mean, I've I've dealt with Jews if they boast if they boast to an uncircumcised Gentile saying, "Well, I'm circumcised." Well, the uncircumcised Gentile in the flesh who's a believer in Jesus Christ can answer boldly, "Well, I am circumcised actually, because I'm circumcised in the spirit." Does that mean that he's saying I'm a Jew? I'm a real Jew? No. No. Nah. No. That God considers oh, yeah. them his people because they're circumcised with the, the circumcision that God made, which makes you accepted before Correct. God. Correct. That doesn't mean that Israel isn't Israel, but they're not accepted before God as, um, well, they're not saved. Yes. And and, and there's a further... That mean there's no there, physical there, promises to that physical nation, correct. but they, they haven't entered into what the Judaism would God would have preferred, which would have been, you know, his people, physical people rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Right. Right. And... and um. What Paul is also communicating is, we are what you were supposed to be. You know, and and that's constantly in the Bible. Romans chapter ten, Paul says that God did. The, you know, He's given us the spiritual kingdom of God, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. The oracles of God now are committed to us rather than the physical Levites. Why? To move them to jealousy. So there is a sense in which we are what this Jew is supposed to have been. But to communicate that does not mean that I am the real Jew and then you're not a real Jew anymore, that you're not a Jew at all in any sense anymore. Even if it did say we are the real Israel, even if it did say that, which it never actually says true Israel, it says the Israel of God. But even if it did say that, again, it would be non secator. It wouldn't mean, so it would mean that um, just because God would call a Gentile believer in Christ, the real Israel, does not invalidate that there are physical blessings associated with the physical descendant of Abraham. Just like, why are Arabs so multitudinous today? Why is there Arabs everywhere you go? Everywhere. There's well, so many. To, um, right. Multiply Ishmael. Say. Right. So obvious. And are you know are they are they saved? No, most of them are Muslims. Right, they're Still sadly they're lost. The gospel concerning the seed of Ishmael, Correct. so God acknowledged that. Seed right, still. right. So that physical blessing is still functioning, as we to the naked we can see it, but it's functioning upon a lost people because it's a physical blessing, and that's all we're saying that physical Israel retains a distinct identity that benefits from physical protection promised to them on basis of them being the physical seed of Abraham, and that at one point, this physical entity will repent, believe in Jesus Christ, and then act as a second fulfillment of Abraham's spiritual seed, so that Abraham will have two lines of spiritual seed, the believing church-age believer, whether he be Jew or Gentile, and the millennial Jew who believes, even the millennial Gentile who believes. He's got two tracks of spiritual seeds. And, oh, and both, both based seed. both based on Jesus Christ, the one seed. Right. And the physical seed is still acknowledged. There's still promises, but he has to bring them through the process where they Correct. have the spiritual inner and the outer. Correct. And so and yeah. uh, so I, I got to run, but I just wanted to make a point. Romans 11, guys, go read Romans 11. Romans 11, Paul says that the branches are also holy. He's talking about the broken branches. He's talking about a derivative holiness that still applies to lost Jews. When he says that they are beloved, they are enemies for the gospel's sake, but beloved for the Father's sake, he's talking about who who is simultaneous. If if there's no some nothing particular about the lost physical Jew, then we, obviously we're talking about a lost Jew because he's an enemy of the gospel. Romans chapter eleven, right? So yeah. <clears throat> Romans chapter eleven. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Lost Jews are saved Jews. 
Lost Jews. Lost Jews. They've got to be lost. They're enemies. They're, they're enemies of the gospel. But as touching yeah. the election, they, who's the they? The lost Jews. Yeah. I same think group you can't of people. Get more clear than that. That, that same, verse really makes it very, very, yeah, very. Yeah. Same clear. group of people. What are they, though? Beloved. Of, of who? Of God. For, for what? Beloved, even in their lost state, God uh -huh. yearns for, you know, like Jesus had a. Uh, like a hen wanting to gather them under his wings, but they wouldn't. Correct. But he still wants them to, and Correct. he still loves them. He's still got so, promises for Correct. them. Correct. And why are they beloved? Yes, they don't believe in... Well, they for don't the believe in Jesus. Sake. Yes, but he told you they're beloved for the Father's sake. He made... If God, if God made... A, if any of you listening to me, if you're a father or your mother, and God made you a promise that I'll always put a special protection for your kids, no matter what, whether they be believers or not, and, you know, and eventually I'm going to bring them all to... to uh, as, a, as a group of people... They're going to grow great and become a group of people. Eventually, everybody in that group of people will be saved. But in the process, there'll be a lot of unbelievers, but I'll still give them a special kind of a blessing for your sake. Wouldn't you dance the jig for joy? Sure you would. He, he, he says, he says he's, and I don't have time to go in and tell. I do have a, a, a video on Romans chapter 11. I had my debate with Dr. Scott Clem, Pastor Scott Clem, uh, where I showed that that was never answered, that there was a derivative of holiness on, on lost Israel. Lost Israel, uh, as touching the election, who those who are enemies of the gospel, so they're still called the election. They're chosen in the flesh for physical blessings for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God hasn't changed his mind about them, even despite their rejection of Christ. The problem of the Gentiles has been, is, will always be. I would not, brethren, verse 25, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That's our problem. That blindness in, in part has happened to Israel. Question, how can, is bl blind Israel, believing or unbelieving? Unbelieving. Unbelieving. And yet he still calls them Israel. Yeah, and then also in Romans 10, he says, um, my heart's desire is for Israel to be saved. Obviously, that's not the church. Right. Yes, <laughs> correct. Exactly. Right. As well. right. And how can they be natural branches? And why is it easier for God to, to, uh, to, um, to graph in natural branches even more e easier than wild branches. Because look, he goes on to say, for if thou art cut off, this is verse 24, out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary, uh, contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these lost Jews, which be natural branches, so the lost Jew is still a natural branch, be grafted in their own olive tree. So Israel is not just a placeholder. He's saying Israel is the own olive tree of the lost Jew. And it's more natural for God to graph in a lost Jew into, into the Abrahamic blessing because it's not about Christ. It's what the Abrahamic blessing through Christ. So it is about Christ, but through the Abrahamic covenant, I should say. Uh, so the question is, what, if, if the lost Jew is in every point, in every point, like any lost Gentile, why would it be more natural for a lost Jew to be grafted into the Abrahamic covenant? He should have no advantage at all whatsoever. There should be no greater congeniality between the lost Jew and the Abrahamic covenant than there is between any lost Gentile and the Abrahamic covenant. And yet Paul tells you, no, there is. There is. There's greater affinity there. It's easier. It's not a, as foreign an organ to graft in to that tree as it was for you to be grafted in. And if they don't continue in unbelief, they, so they have their distinct uh, existence and their holy branches. He says the holy branches were cut off. So in unbelief, he's describing them as holy. What does holy mean? Not saved, set apart. And, you know, of course, world history, touch that Jew and see what happens to you. Everybody that messes with them gets it in the back of the neck. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't work out well eventually for them. No. Daniel, I got to run. I got to, we got to, um, one thing church. before you go, I want, we don't have to look into the scriptures. Maybe people in the comments can just refer to this and love to see what people think. Um, regarding the synagogue of Satan, uh, when I was reading Isaiah, um, it seemed to me that these verses really cross reference well, and we don't have to look at it, but maybe people can comment. It was Isaiah 60, verse 14, and Isaiah. 49, 22 to 26, especially verse 23. So if people want to comment if they think that's a cross-reference, I, I think it is um, a millennial fulfillment with the physical nation there. Sounds about right, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. No worries. All right, God bless you. God bless, brother. Take care.